Today we talk about open source. Many times when I've been interacting with uh, some of you, you know, I realize that you do understand what open source is, but you still don't grasp the full concept of it. Especially when you know we were trying to build the uh, solutions for the different hackathons, and when I was mentioning that there will be open source, I could see you know the difference in knowledge that you had that you couldn't fully grasp it. Also, um, many of you do not also like grasp why do commercial companies actually use open source? What do they actually benefit? So imagine there is a developer that builds an entire code and then they put it on GitHub and it's open, and then how do they actually make money out of it, right? That's why we decided to invite this time around an um, awesome speaker for you with 20 years of experience in open data and standards, working for corporates and then uh, establishing uh, his own uh, startups and companies, Felix Hassel. Would you like to take over the stage? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, I think every time I hear my last name in English, uh, I just say stick to Felix. <laughs> uh, thank you all uh, for uh, inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here. I just got a great uh, tour from Victoria to see uh, this awesome school. I think it's super innovative, and uh, I said to Victoria that... Uh, Man, I should have had such a school when I was young. It's uh, really great. So it's a pleasure to be here and um, talk to you a bit about open source uh, in business and why it matters. Um, first of all, I'm not going to tell you a lot about who I am. I'm, my name is Felix, as you mentioned, uh, as, as Victoria mentioned, and um, I'm an open source program lead at TomTom. And um, I have to say, um, we, we are relatively young in this journey for our company. Um, there are lots of large corporations you are well aware of, like Meta and Google, who are, have established open source program offices. We are developing uh, one at the moment. Uh, and I want to tell you a bit about what that means and, and, and a much more broader perspective on open source, maybe just than the occasional injection of a dependency in your code. <laughs> um, so. Let's start with this. Uh, let's have a, uh, because there are many opinions also about this, and uh, there's no real yeah. There are some definitions about what open source is, but I, I don't really care about it. I, I, I'm very much interested in what you think open source actually is. Any brave souls who want to uh, give me some uh, ideas about it? Give me one second. What is death? One two. Candy. Or? One two. Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> Oh, that's a microphone. Oh, that's uh, clever. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick. Um, I think open source is code published online that is fully uh, operational um, and accessible, so also readable to the masses. Yeah, yeah, very good. I think it's an excellent definition of that. And that might sometimes also be uh, have contributions from users all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Also, very nice. That's that's also open source. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that that uh, that cover that that is a very nice nice covers it. So, who uses open source software? Here, you can raise your hand if you want. Okay. Nobody's using open source yeah. software. Uh, come on, you, this is this is the only way you survive, guys. I think <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> I'm uh, Saladin. I use a lot of open source there. Yeah. And the latest one I added is Anki, I think, for the flashcards. Okay. Nice. Anybody else? Yeah. Wow, you can throw that around. That's cool. <laughs> I want to add one. <laughs> Um, well, I use React a lot, uh, UI framework for the web, uh, and I know that except for React, which is partially open source, I think, uh, a lot of the libraries I use are open source. Yeah. Um, I've also had the ability to uh, provide uh, fixes in case when cool. I uh, have so issues, you did actually... so I have provided a little bit of code to uh, open oh, source wow. sort of stuff. Yeah. So you did some upstream uh, commits? A little bit, yeah. Wow, I, I, that's cool. I don't know if the code actually worked, but... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. We all use open source software. Yeah. We use a shell, we use LS, we use cat, we use, I don't know, 
lots of open source. And software. if you use your iPhone, iPhone, if you use your iPhone, if you would only use an iPhone, would you also use open source software? I guess so. Yes, yes, <laughs> you will. I will, I will show you. I, I think it's really nice. So, and who also creates issues sometimes on repos? Yeah, you obviously create, needed one. Create, yeah. What kind of issues do you create? Like, hey, this doesn't work, man. Fix it, or what? what, what? <laughs> or are you more, <laughs> more in a collaborative mode? What, what is it? No. Now, contributes. We already had a contributor here, so that's, that's, that's awesome, awesome. I think. I think. And are there maintainers in your room? room? You maintain an open source project. Wow, that's cool. Which one? It's called iGraph. It's uh, network analysis. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Wow. Nice. Yeah, I earn money by uh, contributing to an open source project. Okay. Excellent. That's, that's really nice. Cool. Didn't expect that to, to, to hear. It's really nice. Uh, yes, as I just said, uh, just as a. Um, um, I, I think uh, what you said is right. Open source is everywhere. And also, if you only use an iPhone or uh, really a proprietary you know, a product, every product includes open source software. Um, basically, you could even argue that if it has a TCP IP stack in it, <laughs> it has open source software uh, in it. What you see here is just if you go to any product, you can go to these settings and then the about, and then there are this boring menu item, which is called legal and just as information, those kind of things. And what you see here are just a verbatim copy of all different kind of licenses and attributions towards authors of open source software which is included in the iPhone. It's not only open source software, there are also legal statements about commercial software which is ingested in it. But this list actually represents people and communities who build software which makes the iPhone possible. And, and it, it goes, goes much, much further than that because, because um, as you already mentioned, um, basically our whole society runs in open source software. And it's not always apparent to people that that's really the case. And what, what I want to mention, mention it's not only about open source uh, software, it's really about people, because all these software is basically is a representation of your ID, you have to solve something, you build software, and it's, uh, there are communities around it, sometimes there are more people, bigger software projects even have collectives of people and organizations working on it. So it's actually a real large ecosystem of people who, who, uh, who built this software and, and where our uh, society relies on, Facebook, Google, Beautiful AI self-driving cars are not possible without open source software. Um, so, um, but the other end of the story is uh, something which uh, maintainers may also uh, be familiar with, is the fact that all our modern infrastructure apparently runs on open source software, but sometimes there are open source projects which are maintained by a single person which is just doing that because of a hobby or a special interest or some motivations why you wanna, wanna do that. And just to give you an example, last December, maybe you've read about the log for shell exploit, which was a vulnerability in the log for shell library. It's actually maintained by, I think, two people. And they had the biggest corporations on earth asking them, please fix this, fix this, fix this. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'm trying. So this, this also represents the other spectrum of open source. And I want to take you on a journey uh, between those two extremes. <laughs> I first want to briefly touch upon the history about free and open source software. And with every history lesson, uh, history is all about different perspectives and different stories. This is just my perspective. There are many more. And if you're going to study and read upon this, there are, uh, there's a lot more to it than what I will uh, tell you, but I'll provide you with a brief uh, timeline of uh, the history of that. Then I'm going to touch a bit on how we in corporations use open source software and why it's important to us and what kind of things you need to manage in order because it's, it goes much further than if you have your little project or your project or you're working on, you ingest a dependency, you don't really need to care about you know, the licenses or whether you're legally allowed to or whatever. You know, those things become more apparent when you actually build products or, or, or need to distribute your code to others. And last, I will tell you a bit more about open source program officers, what they are, what they do. Uh, and I'm also going to uh, ask you if uh, maybe there are some people in the room who want to help me with that. Um, but first, let's start with this. Um, this is, uh, I, I was just trying to, to look in the, the history books. And what I found was a very interesting case that basically if you have an ID in most countries, you automatically have the copyright on your ID. That means that you are the owner of your ID and you can basically determine what you want to do with it, how you want to sell it, distribute it. 
So also in this time, the two-stroke engine, the gasoline engine, was patented by a single company. And that meant that there was only one company allowed to sell this technology, which is not really nice, right? To have one company who says about how we make engines. And then Henry Ford, that's this guy, uh, famous of the Ford uh, company, of course, challenged that patent in court and he won. And that meant that that patent wasn't valuable anymore and anybody could use a two-stroke engine in a car. But what happened was very interesting because there were many more automobile manufacturers who wanted to build a car. And what they did, they made, the, they made an, uh, an agreement with each other to say, hey, all our ideas and inventions, we still patent them, so protect them, that means, but we give them away for free so that other people can also use it. So that was basically the, the that's how the automotive, automotive industry was born that more companies were allowed to make cars and not compete maybe uh, on, on the, the concept of a two-stroke engine, but actually you know, innovate on it. So getting to four, V4, V8 engines and what you have now. Um, so then in the 1950s, when computers became a bit more, I have to say, or still a rarity, if you had a computer, you had a room like this with one computer, and if you wanted to use it, you had to plan that in advance half a year and then maybe you get 10 minutes to run your code on one computer. So computers were much more used in academia, universities, and software or computer instructions were not really considered that special. You know, it was really normal to share those kind of things because you just didn't have a lot of access to computers. Uh, so it was much more about the hardware and software was just, yeah, we share that, we share those ideas so that you can make optimal use of your time uh, at the computer. Um, then around the 70s, these uh, things began to change. Um, and there's some, actually a weird story about this because, uh, as I just said, if you think about a story, you write it down, you have the copyright to your story. If you make music, it's the same thing. But in the US, up until 1974, software was not possible to copyright. So you couldn't protect it. There was no legal way to protect software. So basically, you couldn't sell it in a sense or protect it or whatever. And this guy, uh, a young uh, Bill Gates, and there were much more people involved. It was not just Microsoft, it was also Apple um, who, who litigated in court around this, but said, yeah, it's not really fair. I create basic a programming language and in hobby computer clubs, everybody is copying that. Copying that. I spent years on developing that. Everybody may use it. Uh, and I can't earn money with it, which has, of course, some merit to the ID, right? I mean, if you spend a lot of time on, on making something, you want to get paid for that. Um, so um, that happened, basically. And what, what, just to go back a bit, what, what that meant was that software was copyrightable. And what Bill Gates and other companies figured out is, hey, what if I don't sell you the software, but I sell you the rights to use it? That's something different. I just tell you, you may use my software, you don't own it, I can do whatever I want with it, and you can only use it. So DOS, Windows, all those operating systems were closed. You couldn't see the source code anymore. You could just purchase a license to use it, and basically a software industry was born. But then around the 80s, this person came around. His name is Richard Stallman, for open source lovers, a very, um, I think, uh, noticeable person. Um, and he was working at MIT Media Lab uh, in the 80s, and he was working on a Unix computer, and he had a printer, uh, but uh, this printer didn't work. So he thought, hey, I'm just going to hack the source code, make it work on my system. But the source code of the printer driver was closed and proprietary, so he couldn't figure out how it worked. Couldn't study it, couldn't change it, couldn't modify it, so basically rendering the print useless for him. And that really triggered him and inspired him and said, why, why is this? Why can't I just have the human right to see how something is made so that I can study and learn from it? Then if I think it should maybe be modified, modify it. And even if I want to distribute it for any purpose, why can't I do that? So th that is a, a real different idea on, on, on software, uh, which he uh, thinks. And so he thought like, when you bought a big computer at the time, you got Unix with it, a Unix operating system. There were many flavors, uh, but it was closed and proprietary. So he thought like, I'm going to make an operating system which is open. Uh, and he started with writing Emacs, uh, which is a, an, uh, an editor some of you might know. 
uh, and also the first uh, GNU C compiler. Um, imagine that. I'm just going to start write a C compiler. Yeah, you can do that. That is what he did. But he had a big problem because when he basically figured out all the command line tools and the editors and compilers, he needed a kernel for the operating system which interacts with the hardware. So that is very hard and he was busy building it. It's called Hurdle. It's still in development. So if you're curious, <laughs> I think it's still not at uh, point, uh, zero over zero dot one, but at least um, he was looking around like, how can I come to this dream of an open, open OS? And then this person came around. His name is Linus Torvalds. And some of you might know him. Linus Torvalds was a student at the university in Espo and Helsinki. Um, and he was also interested in operating systems. So he started with Mimix, or Minix, Mimix, Minix, uh, which is actually developed here in the Netherlands by the famous Richard Tenenbaum, which was a first attempt of writing an open source, uh, open source kernel. And as he was using it, he found it to become limited for him. So he started thinking of, I'm going to rewrite this. And so the Linux kernel was born. So if we talk about Linux, we're actually not referring to an operating system, but we're referring to a kernel. Um, and then this person met the other person I just showed you, Richard Stallman, where they had the command line tools, the, 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 the compiler, the editor, the kernel, and so the first Linux versions were born. And I think the rest is history. We now have lots of different flavors and lots of different distributions. And Linux powers, I think, almost all computers running in the cloud. Um, uh, so everything you interact with, infrastructure in telcos, basically anything we use runs on Linux, which is kind of mind-blowing, right? Every time I tell it, <laughs> it still blows my mind. Um, so there, there are some, some talk about free software, open source, open source software. Basically, there are, this is a very heated uh, <laughs> debate in, 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 in this community. I won't bore you with that. But basically, free software was more like a social movement, right? It was socially motivated to say, hey, I think human beings should have the right to always study change and modify code. Um, but um, in, the, in the 90s, when um, uh, there was a guy called um, Eric Raymond, who also write, wrote a book, an essay about it, why um, uh, about open source and the movement of uh, Netscape, which was one of the first browsers, who also became open source, but they didn't find this language, or I have to put it, the language and the social motive appealing towards a company, right? So they tried to rebrand the idea of free software and called it open source because free is also like, yeah, what do you mean? Free as in liberty, of course, not free as in beer. Um, I'll move a bit uh, along. Um, what is open source software? People already said it, it's publicly open. You can, can read code. So it's basically source code. It is released under a license. A license is a legal document stating the terms and conditions on how you may use this code and how you can distribute it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think what is apparent to all open source is that you always have the right to study, change and distribute it provided on different circumstances. But I will tell you a bit later about that. Also an important part is that open is not really referring only to the source code, right? Open is much more about the fact that uh, it's an open way of collaborating with each other on software code, like you do here. That's also some, some kind of open, open way of doing uh, those kind of things. So it's, it's more about how you collectively create and shape software, distribute it uh, towards other people. And also the community, of course, around that, because there's a large community around people who contribute or occasionally contribute or people who actually maintain code or uh, have ideas about those things. Um, as I said, this license, which is this legal document, which you saw flying around uh, in the iPhone at the beginning, uh, there are many variants. So uh, there are around 80, uh, probably more, depends on how you um, have your criteria set, but let's say 80 uh, licenses, and they all have some kind of way of restrictiveness. So I'm just not going to go over all of them. You can read on the on the net uh, a lot about this. But I think the most um, uh, less restrictive one is public domain. That may, basically means if you have source code and you put it in the public domain, anybody can use it for any purpose. So let's imagine you write a piece of software, you publicly put it on GitHub and you said the license is public domain, I can pick it up, enhance it, make it closed source and sell it. No problem. That's, you can do that. That's, that's legally possible. If you go a bit more to the right, 
code is more license become more restrictive. So if you look at, uh, for instance, the the, the 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 permissive licenses have have which is weird. We call it permissive licenses. They have some you know limitations on what you can do with the code. Um, and then even a more restrictive, and this might sound counterintuitive, is copyleft. Copyleft licenses basically have a clause in it which states that if you use a dependency. Uh, from a library which is licensed, for instance, under the GNU public license, and you license that, you want to use that, that means that the, the code you use it in must be available under the same license, right? So if you don't know about that and you just, oh, this is a nice open source library, it has GPL license, great, I'm going to use it, but oh, 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 I'm, oh, now I need to open source my entire product. And if, of course, if you're working in an R&D kind of environment, who cares? But if you work in a company, this is something you want to know. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the proprietary licenses, which are commercial licenses, are most restrictive, which basically state, uh, you know, any, anything you do will be used against you. Uh, <laughs> just uh, making fun. So, open source really means business. So, why are companies interested in open source? I think that, as I said, more than 90% of, of all software in the world is open source uh, software. There are many companies who started on this. and found ways to make a living on it, which I will touch on briefly. And um, the last one is just to show you in the open source service industry, so that's much more like uh, service support and SaaS business, there's, there's more like a 20.7 billion uh, market there, uh, which grows 18% every year. So uh, it's quite, quite interesting, right? So open source and business. Um, I'm gonna tell another story about a old person. <laughs> Um, this person here is Malcolm McLean, and Malcolm McLean was a person who invented the modern sea container we see in the harbors, which we take for granted. You pick up a sea container, put it on a train, put it on a truck, and this all magically works all across the globe. But this wasn't the case in the 50s and the 60s. This person had patented his, his design ID of the sea container, and he was the only one on the planet who could use it and sell it. And he was very successful, so he sold a lot of these sea containers. And then he came up to a point where he needed to change highways, he needed to change trucks, he needed to change ships, he needed to change harbors to process these sea containers. And you can imagine that, you know, building a sea container and selling it is a bit easier than, you know, lobbying for 10 years with the government to change an entire port, right? So there was a limit there in what, you, what he could do. And what he said was, well, you know what I do? I'm confident that I can build the best sea containers, the most competitive, the best price, best quality. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to open source my design. Anybody may use this design in the world. And I'm not afraid that there will be competitors who eat market share away from me. Because what, he do, what he's done was say, yes, my market share will become very small, but the market will be humongously big. So that is the idea of how you can use open source in order to create markets or to change the way in how you sell your product. And this is, I think, a very nice example of this when open source wasn't even a thing. So there are many reasons why companies, for instance, like TomTom Tom or Facebook open source things. And here are just a few. And I think I wanna highlight a few which are, to me, very interesting. I just gave you an example of how you can open up things to you know, grow adoption, for instance, of a product. Um, but there are also ways of where you can say, hey, maybe there are things we all need to do, like managing containers in a Kubernetes cluster. Why would everybody create their own software to do that? It, it doesn't make sense. Then everybody will spend the same amount of money on the same problem, and everybody has to reinvent the wheel anytime, and that doesn't make sense. So that is a perfect opportunity to say, hey, this is where we as corporations can collaborate and, and work uh, upon and share those costs of innovation and, and development. Uh, and, and that is how big open source projects are born, like Kubernetes, for, in, for instance, or React uh, as a matter. And there are many, 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 many more. Um, or Linux uh, kernel, for instance, which is still, um, um, of course, being developed. Um, other things are also interesting because talent like yourself, who may be works on a project and ingests a 
code base which is being built by a certain company and you're really thinking like, wow, this is, this is, this is great software, I will build that, may also be an interesting way to attract talent so that people say, hey, wow, this, this company is actually doing these kind of things, I want to work at such a company. So these are also things why we are interested in those kind of things. And there are some other things um, which you can read. And I'll provide some links at the end of the presentation where you can study all these things a bit later on. So the question about how do you earn money with open source? Because if I just put it on the internet for free, how do I earn money, right? Um, maybe I get some donations, uh, but it's not really nice. Through time, there are, there are many more. But that is confusing because this is a field which is still in development, which we call, of course, business models, which basically state how do you earn, what kind of model do you employ in order to earn money with software. The most, or the first one, was actually support and services. So um, think about companies like Ubuntu or Red Hat. Ubuntu, you can just download Linux, you can use it, you can do anything you want with it, but how on earth do they earn money? Imagine you are a big corporation and you, 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 um, you have contracts with clients where you state that your systems need to be up and running 99% of the time. And you have all kinds of guarantees. Now, guarantees is a complicated word, but at least you have all kinds of commitments towards your customers. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call if you have a problem or you don't know, right? So service and support is more about the business model. Hey, here you have my Linux version or my product. It's open source. If you want to use it, you can use it, but you're responsible if something breaks down, if you need to do security patches, you need to install it, whatever, you, you're responsible. Maybe I don't want that. So then I can sign a contract with Ubuntu or Red Hat and say, hey, can you help me? Can you consult me? So we have consultants who, who help me integrate it. That is their business model, which is quite successful if you look at these two companies. I think the founder of this company went to space. It's a thing. It's a thing. Um, the second one um, is called open core. And open core is more like saying, I have a piece of code which is open source. Anybody can use it and we develop on it. But there are some features which are really interesting, for instance, for big corporations, like identity management or maybe some advanced orchestrational features or whatever you can think of. And those features are proprietary. Closed. We don't share them with the world. So in that sense, you can still see what's under the hood, basically the, the, the core of the, of the product, but the, the added bonuses you can't see. Those are hidden. Um, and there are some companies who, who employ this business model. And actually, if you look at it, this is also what Google does, right? Chrome OS is open source, as in Chromium. Um, Android is open source. Um, but if you want to have the vanilla Google uh, Google Play Store verified uh, image, that's another problem, that's closed, right? So there are many of these examples where you can earn money. The last one is more like uh, software as a service, it touches a bit upon the previous one, but uh, it's the same thing. I can download WordPress, install it on the server, host it, update it every time when there is an update. Uh, if there's a problem, I reinstall it. I can do all these things but maybe I don't have time and I just want to write nice blog posts, right? So I can say, hey, automatic in this part, please do that for me. I don't want to worry about it. I just want to use it. And GitHub is, I think, also a good example of it because GitHub is just using Git. Git was made in 10 days by Linus Torvalds, right? And they made a whole company on it. So just go figure. <laughs> Um, so the, the way how I look at open source is really as a model for collaboration between companies where you can uh, speed innovation and drive adoption of a product or improve the reliability because you have much more knowledge. Uh, and that in, in a sense is a flywheel where you can also experiment with these different business models. And that's why it's very interesting for companies to open source uh, parts of their um, um, stack. Um, um, and there are many examples. I mean, TensorFlow is, yeah, is a big AI uh, machine learning framework, which is open source. Uh, there are so many examples of this. So, I'll suppose, open source program offices. Um, basically, if you're in a company, you need to manage so open source software. As I just said, if we build a product um, where, which we want to keep proprietary because we, we don't want to spill our beans, but we ingest a library which has this nice uh, you know, license clause like, hey, if you use this, this thing where you use it in needs to be 
uh, publicly available under the same license as well. And that is something we don't like. We want to know what is in our software. So that means we need to do software composition analysis on code. And you can imagine that in a small project, this is manageable. Um, depends if you use Node. Uh, you've sometimes seen the, <laughs> the amount of dependencies which get injected. But um, if you're running a project which has more than a million lines of codes and maybe 30,000 dependencies, and these dependencies also have dependencies on other dependencies, then the story becomes very complicated. And if you have to store those results because you have customers uh, which um, uh, make cars, like in our case, um, uh, the bar is even higher because cars uh, have sometimes a lifespan of 10 or 15 years. That means that software needs to be retained for 15 years. Can you imagine 15 years of code? 15 years ago, what we had, it's, that's a long time for, for software to, to stay uh, somewhere. So what does an open source program office do? Does? First of all, it communicates and develops with stakeholders in the community strategy. So how can we use open source, for instance, to attract talent? Or how can we use open source in, to grow adoption of our products? Or how can we use open source to uh, reduce duplicate R&D? Because there may be some things we all do where we can work together with other companies, even your competitors, to, to improve things for people, right? Um, other things are more like the communities around it. So um, I will touch upon that later, but really, for instance, fostering an open source culture is, is more like working inside a company the same as if you would work in an open source project. Uh, this is called inner sourcing, for instance. Um, but another very important aspect of it is the last one, which is that you are compliant, legally compliant to all those licenses which are in there. So can you imagine the process at Apple for their iPhone, which I showed you in the beginning? That is, they need to keep track of all those things because they can be legally liable if they do things which they aren't allowed to do. And of course, errors are being made in those things, which is fine. Everybody understands this is a complex uh, affair. Um, and this is really interesting because it's not only about the technology, but it's really how did this technology being used, uh, you know, in a broader sense. That's a, it's really about strategy, strategy of the company, so you're really involved in decision making on a high level, which is super interesting to see because uh, you learn a lot about how a company operates um, and, and what is important to them. Um, so yeah, just maybe not clear, so an open source program office is really a, a mini team inside a big company which has multiple stakeholders from legal, from marketing, from engineering of course, who work together uh, on promoting open source within the company and outside of the company. I had briefly touched about this as well. Um, open source is also being used for inner sourcing. So you can imagine that open source communities, which especially live for 15 years, have learned a lot of how you need to work together in the open without having a formal organization or a director or all these things we have in companies. And there are a lot of best practices which are being employed. So now it's fairly standard to have CI, CD pipelines and DevOps stuff, but all these things originate from open source communities because they didn't have the, the you know big teams who could, could work on these things. So they needed to automate those things. And there, are, for instance, your whole Git flow thing with pull requests and all those things uh, also come from open source software. Or if you go to an open source project, you have a document which states, hey, if you want to do a contribution, these are the steps you need to do. Those are very interesting things for companies because in our, you know, we have over 1500 engineers working in separate teams on code. But this code is also reliant upon each other. So it's very interesting to, to also have cross-collaboration and cross-contribution, but this has to be done in an orderly fashion, of course. But you can look at open source communities, how they do that and employ those best practices. Super interesting. Um, this is a bit more about strategy setting. So this is more trying to understand why do you consume open source or use open source software and what do you want to get out of it, what do you want to do with it, um, how do we consume it, So, and, and how do we contribute to it, to which projects do we contribute, what are our guidelines, can any engineer contribute, uh, or if we want to do larger contributions to bigger projects, how do we do that, how do we engage in that, what kind of decisions do we need to make in order to decide which open source project we should contribute, all those kind of questions. And basically this picture at the right, I don't know where the light is, ah, fancy. Um, means that this is basically a maturity or a way of looking at effort you need to take and the time it takes to implement 
things. So the first things are much more about using open source. So there's more compliance kind of thing, um, adopting it, testing it, which is allowed to ingest and not. Participant is much more that you, you know, interact with more communities so that engineers of us also contribute towards other code bases. And then you get more into the involvement with open source foundations and you, you actually go much more participate and much more structural investments in open source. And of course, the, the biggest ones are here. So think about Facebook, think about Google, who actually run a lot of open, big open source projects um, to, uh, to, to work on those kind of things. So what does an OSPO do? There is no one model for an open source program office. It really depends on the company, the size of the company, what, kind of, what the strategy is. But this just gives you a horizon on things you need to think about when you work in an open source project. So just to highlight a few uh, portals, so to, to, to make a developer portal saying, how can I use open source software? How do I release it? How do I engage with the community? What things are allowed, which aren't, uh, what things aren't allowed. Uh, this is more the compliance and strategy part. So that's uh, making sure that if we deliver software to a car manufacturer, that they know what is inside there and that we don't use licenses we don't want uh, in there uh, and, and maintaining those kind of things. Um, but also education, which is super nice. So outreach um, tools. So how do you analyze all these uh, source codes and, and things? Um, so it's, I think a super diverse job, really nice. So it's not coding only, it's really about managing uh, source code and, and working together with people, which is super nice. Um, yeah, and then I want to conclude with some challenges and then uh, do some Q&A. Um, the challenges, um, you know, it's, in the beginning I showed you this picture of this, this whole digital society and there was this little brick of one person maintaining it. And I think it's, it's very important to mention this. Uh, open source is not only a very nice, glamorous story, rock star, like, oh, this is great. Uh, there are some really serious um, challenges in, in open source. Um, and just uh, to, to highlight a few, funding is one, of course. Um, you don't get paid for the work you do. Uh, how, and if your project becomes bigger and you have a job, what are you going to do? You, you're going to quit your job and then do that for free? <laughs> that, that doesn't really work, right? Um, Another thing is that uh, contributions, which we call a bit of a contribution long tail. Just to give you an example, this is Bootstrap, it's a really old metric, but Bootstrap you know, of course, which is a, as a, as a framework for, for websites. Um, uh, it has three maintainers, um, but these three maintainers, or uh, uh, let, let me say, they have three maintainers, but 95% of, of all commits are done by 5% of the contributors. So it's not the story about, oh, if I have a lot of contributors, then this will be great. Um, and there is another side to this. Uh, GitHub made it really easy for people to contribute code, which is nice, but it also gets a lot of tension on maintainer side because you get low quality contributions, which take a lot of time of maintainer's time to actually integrate this code. So there, there are some dynamics at play there which, which, where there's friction and tension on those things. And that means that maintainers really experience workload and stress uh, on these things. This is, uh, this is just a small survey done uh, by uh, Tidelift um, um, about asking um, uh, known maintainers and lesser known maintainers, what, 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 are you, what do you dislike about this? Um, and as you can see, yeah, not, financially, or not financially compensated for all my work or feeling appreciated and it's thankless because I also think all these platforms and tools are nice but there's one important element we forget that at the other end of the line, there's a human being like you. And I think if there's one thing I want to uh, give you is that please bear in mind that we are all people. So that is software, but this software is created and made possible by other people. So uh, take that in mind when you use something or contribute to, to something. Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, oh, I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, we are setting up an open source program office. And as you can imagine, uh, that is quite a challenge, super nice challenge, I have to say. Um, and it's very diverse. And I'm looking for people who want to work with me for half a year um, uh, on, on further developing the open source program office within TomTom. Tom. So this, this could be, if you're more into the engineering, it could be, you know, providing tools 
or, or doing integrations, but maybe you're also interested to learn a bit more about engineering management or software strategy or strategy or products and more and more the you know, company side of software and so on the engineering side, but more the product side. If you're an entrepreneurial person and you like to do new things, which, which um, yeah, that means that not everything is, you know, set. But if you like that, and if, if that sounds great to you, and you want to learn more about open source and work in a big uh, engineering um, uh, community, please reach out to me, and then maybe I'll see you as an intern for half a year, and uh, we'll make open source a success within uh, TomTom. And uh, that, uh, that's, I think, the end of my presentation. There are some resources. I will share them with uh, Victoria. Books and links you can read uh, about this topic. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you. And um, I would love to take some questions or hear some ideas of you on this topic. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. To be honest, guys, this talk was like honey to my soul. Why? Because I'm a big um, open source. Believer, <laughs> believer, and uh, you know, in, in the previous company, I actually worked with corporates and ministries in the Netherlands to actually create open source solutions, and I've seen the benefit of it. Like, okay, just one, one yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I, I somehow um, believe that um, we are moving away from the capitalism structure based on competitive advantages. Where back in the days in the 80s, the way you said everything was patented, now we are moving towards capitalism based on mass collaboration. Right now, it's very difficult to come up with something completely, completely new. But if you start building solutions that integrate amongst each other and help other people out, this is the new way of looking at things. So after I've been working for OTC like before, I realized that more and more corporates and actual governments are actually thinking about this sort of. Uh, uh, implementation of uh, um, collaboration. And uh, one more thing, do you remember the talk that we had with uh, Corona Melder? Yeah. Corona Melder is the best example of how the government opened up the source code, right, for building this uh, tracking of uh, COVID. Um, and multiple people actually contributed to work towards it. The team itself, we had one of the developers giving a talk, the team itself was eight people. Eight people and they managed to pull it out within you know, months, which is very difficult, considering the complexity of uh, yeah. security and so on. And one last thing, yeah. I remember, I'm not going to point out fingers, but one time uh, when I just uh, started working, we were in the lockdown and I had this chat with one of the students during our monthly coalition drinks, back then we could do it only online. Listen, I had this student and I spoke to, to the person for two hours about open source and I couldn't convince him. And I, I wish I had this presentation up <laughs> front. <laughs> because the way you actually put it out there, it was so clear and so well you know, argumented. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions. I would like to encourage the people from Barcelona, Moscow, and the other people that are following from home. Go please to Slido.com and then hashtag CodamX, capital C, capital X, and you put your um, uh, questions over there. Meanwhile, let's take a couple of questions from the audience. Who has the, the box? Oh, good. Hi. Um, my question was, how often does open source become kind of closed source once the, the, it, once it gains market share? Ooh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question, and I think there's no one answer. Um, what you do see is that there are companies who, um, and I think uh, Elastic is, is, is kind of, no, it's not really a good example, but sometimes there are ways where people would say, hey, um, uh, so there's an open source project which is completely open source, but maybe it's driven by a company, uh, you know, and that they decide that the license will change. So that they say, hey, what we're now going to do is we're going to make open core, uh, for instance, as business model, meaning that still a part will be open source, but there will also be a, 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 another part which will be closed uh, source. I do not, cannot recall from my mind where where there are examples where it's completely 
uh, closed off. Those exist. I know that they exist, but I can't give you an example. But it's, I think, um, it's more an exception because um, if if you have an open source project which is really successful. Uh, then there's also lots of opportunity to collaborate and find other ways of, of, of earning money or, or, you know, if you're in a business setting uh, to, to, to do things. But there are stories about uh, projects uh, pulled off in that way or used in different licenses uh, and then sometimes people have forks, right? Because you can still have use the old project and continue. So there, there are examples of communities where there are forks of uh, things which are not open source anymore but still live on as a open source kind of variant. There are also of course communities because there are people who don't agree with each other. There are many, there's great prosa <laughs> online about this where communities split. It's not really nice if it happens. Um, but yeah, th those things happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's say I want to create my own uh, open source project. What would be a beginner friendly source? A uh, license you mean to... No, uh, no, just to read up on, okay, I want to start this project, how... how? Oh, oh yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I have a link dump here. Um, so um, uh, I, I really love this book, uh, the, the, the Making uh, and Maintenance of Open Source Software, but I think a good way of, of going in there is first to actually participate in an open source project. So to learn what, what is there. So if there's a project you care about, or a library you care about, or, or maybe a community of people you care about, is actually to start engaging, reading contribution guidelines, seeing what, if that's a fit for you, and then you can also learn a bit more on, hey, what does it take to do these kind of things? Um, and of course, there are many links. So for instance, the Do Group is much more oriented towards open source program offices, but it contains a lot of interesting information about uh, open source projects, um, uh, much more from a company perspective, but also includes a lot of interesting ideas. Um, and uh, don't don't hold yourself off, you can just start it. Eh? I mean, you don't need to be a official open source project. I mean, if you, I think the most important thing is if you do that, if you open source something, is that you keep in mind a few basic things. Have a proper readme, so who maintains the code, have a contributor guide, so how do you want to accept contributions, and pick a license. Because a lot of code is there which doesn't have a license, and you are the copyright owner, and you may decide how you want to license your code. So it's really important to pick a license. And of course, if you're more in a, you know, more like uh, playing with code at home, that doesn't really matter, of course, but because you, you're just there and using it internally. But if you, if you, you know, want to open up, those are the important things to, to uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, uh, then, then just start and see what happens. It's, uh, <laughs> um, for the past year when I've been putting my projects online, uh, even though most of them are not sort of great projects, uh, I have always added an MIT license, uh, which as far as I know is sort of like the, the, the first basic license you can add to your project sort of to have at least something officially there. Um, but what I've been trying to Google but have got no clear answer about is what kind of MIT-like license uh, still licenses your code, but also requires the user to either give credits or something relating to the original contributor of the code. Yeah, so what you're talking about, which we call is attribution and copyright notices. But I believe that MIT, you are, uh, you, you are, you are obliged to uh, uh, to have an, an attribution. So if someone were to use, for, for example, my uh, open source portfolio yeah. website, someone would still have to mention me as a as copyright owner. As copyright yeah. Owner. So there, there are some, what, what sometimes is a bit confusing uh, is, of course, the people who author it don't necessarily have to be the copyright owner, right? So there are some, in your case, you're the copyright owner and also the author. Um, and um, um, that, that means that if you have an MIT license and somebody else would pick it up uh, and change and modify it, then I should still have a copyright notice in my header file. So it says copyright your name, years, and then copyright modifications by me. Uh, yeah, but, but um, I have to be honest, I'm not a, um, I, I always go to, T, there's a TLDR website which covers all the licenses and the beauty of that website is that it also has the human readable part where you don't need to go to all the legal mumbo jumbo uh, because just to give you some challenge, 
uh, um, public domain waives copyright. But there are some companies which do not legally allow you to do that. So, uh, go figure. <laughs> so, but that's, that's a bit more the legal side of it, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Does that, that answer it a bit? Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. No one? Oh, yeah. Uh, what are the security implications of open source code? I mean, if it's widely available and anyone can see it, isn't it easier to write exploits for it? That's that's uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, but what I can also provide you with a counter argument. What if it was closed and there was an exploit and I couldn't see it and the company would hit it for me? I, I think you know you're you're right because this is a bit uh, of course lame to do. Um, Work for J and. Uh... Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think, um, um, uh, you know, uh, one of the, you know, uh, I, I, I do think that in certain parts, um, open source software allowed people to look at it. Uh, and that means that more eyes see more. And that also means that as, if there are more eyes and who are good willing people, which there are, will report this CVE and, 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 ha and have it up there. And at least you have the possibility to see it because there are also cases where there are commercial companies who have proprietary code, but keep this a secret for a very long time and then it leaks out. And there are very much stories about this. So I think it's a two way kind of thing. It also depends, for instance, uh, we, uh, I worked at a, which is also very interesting to, to, to look at, which is the Foundation for Public Code here in Amsterdam. Uh, they, they advise governments on, on, on um, uh, uh, basically policy making around open source. Is that there are use cases, of course, where open source software uh, is, uh, is a bit more scrutinized. For instance, if, you're, if, if it's code which runs in, 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 in security things or, you know, um, uh, handling passports or, uh, you know, uh, sending out, uh, uh, how do you say that? Um, 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 if you, for speed limits, how do you call that? I forgot the English word. If you get a, a fine, yeah, a ticket. Um, but I generally believe that um, um, code which is transparent um, uh, leads to better security than code which is, um, which is proprietary and closed because there is no way of checking it. Yeah. But, but there are differences. Eh? If you make uh, autopilot software in an airplane, Maybe you want to, uh, but that, you know, that could also be argued. You know, Mars Rover is open source. You can just check out the code and then see how the helicopter flies. It's great. <laughs> uh, can I, can, before we move to the next question, I'll be the voice from the people, uh, for the people from... Yeah, I would, I expected this one. Out loud. Which project, be it from TomTom Tom or not, would you love to see open source? But it's not yet. Ooh, first of all, great question. Um, yeah, I think I, 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 maybe that's a bit of a generic answer. So whoever you are, uh, um, I, I think that um, source or software which powers our democracies, right? So which is built with our taxpayers' money, I think should be open source, all of it. Uh, and that is because I think that if you would say that if we create policy and rules and law, uh, this has a democratic process which is transparent, which you can follow, where you can provide feedback, right? Uh, so then it's a bit strange that the software you needs to execute that law doesn't adhere to the same principles as that. Um, and, and, and that is where, for instance, the Free Software Foundation has a, has a, has a campaign on that, uh, public code uh, or public money, public code, and as I just mentioned, the Foundation for Public Code. For technical things, Whew. I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a music person, uh, and there are some great open source uh, uh, digital audio workstations, but uh, there, I have some favorites, but uh, it would be nice to see, uh, for instance, uh, Reaper open source or some of those things, but yeah, it, it will be hard, but um, 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 yeah. Those kind of things. Yeah. I would like, uh, if quickly I can read the second one. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> what is the difference between open source and licensed software? And maybe if I can add, what is the free software? So there is such thing as free software. What is the difference? Yeah, so, so that is basically what I just described. Eh? So um, basically, I will get burned for this when I say this, but. It, 
technically free software and open source software are kind of the same thing. Because what you do is you open up the code and you have a license where you as the copyright owner describe on what people can do with it. And what they both have in common is that you always have the right to study, change, modify and distribute it. But maybe the conditions of those three things change, right? So that's the, that's the first thing. So when we refer to free software, the term is much more referring to the social movement. I just shown you open source is the rebranding of free and open source software. But just forget about that. You, have, you are the owner, you create something, you are the copyright owner, and you employ a legal document, which is a license where you state, hey, this is how you may distribute the code and use it. So to get to the question about what is the difference between open source and licensed software, it depends on how you say it. it's all licensed software, right? So basically all that software, also commercial software has a license, but as I've just shown you in the picture, commercial software is, is, is at the right uh, spectrum, which is really restrictive about what you can do with it. So to give you an example, we work with OEMs and car manufacturers where they need to integrate code from us. That means they need to have access to our source code. But it doesn't mean we want to have that open source. So they are able to integrate it into their digital cockpits, for instance, and learn and study and collaborate with, with us. But they aren't allowed to distribute that to, to, to others. Or, you know, so it's really a commercial licensed uh, way. So in that sense, if you say, what's the difference between open source and licensed software? If you mean um, licensed as in proprietary software, it's basically the terms and conditions stated in the license. So commercial software is restrictive about what you can do with it. And if you go much more to the less restrictive with public domain at the, you know, at the very end, is, there are no restrictions. You can just use, do whatever you want with it. I, I hope this answered your question, wherever you are. And, and the, the next one, because everything is the same, guys, with license, intellectual property, <coughs> let's address it so that we... Is open source, uh, open source software protected by intellectual property law? Yeah, so here you again need to make the distinction between the term open source software and intellectual property and law, right? So every, different nations have different laws around copyright. This is, this is what it makes complex. But for instance, in the Netherlands, the law is that if I create something, a body of work that could be a play, a poem, music, video, software, whatever, I am the legal owner of that body of work. So I can do whatever I want with that. Um, and uh, so I am protected by property laws we have in the Netherlands about this. Enforcing them, of course, is the difficult part. How do you know that somebody is you know, sneaky using that and selling it? That is not what the law does. The law says it's, you cannot do that. So if you know about it, you can, you, you know, you can file for, for, for something. So that's intellectual property law. And yes, if you have a, depends on what kind of license you state. So if you have a license where you still retain copyright, so MIT, for instance, you don't waive your copyright. In the MIT license, you still say, hey, I am the copyright owner, but here are the terms and conditions on how you can use it. So that means that uh, as long as these terms and conditions in the license are compatible with the law, this is important because you cannot think and dream up a contract you would like, which does not, is not compatible with law. As long as it's compatible with the law, you can enforce the law on those things. And that's why it's so important for companies who use open source software to be legally compliant to the terms and conditions in all those licenses. So there's some automation for that because I'm not going to go through, you know, a project which has 40,000 dependencies with different licenses. It's, it's a pain, but that, I hope this answers your question. So you, you, have, you have an ID. You have a copyright owner and the copyright owner tells you in the form of a license what you can do with it. And this license can be very restrictive and commercial and secret, which is proprietary, or it can be do whatever you want with it. No. Can, we, can we do one last question? Yeah, yeah. Can we go there as well? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, what kind of things or projects is TomTom Tom looking to open source or are you already doing? <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, I cannot, of course, make any statements on things which we may or may not do in the future. Uh, okay. But I can tell you about exciting things we have already done, uh, which is, of course, we look at all these things. And that is also, if you come, 
become an intern at the open source, you will, you will get the answer to this question. <laughs> uh, but um, um, what is what is a very important, uh, I th or at least my personal opinion about a very important open source project uh, TomTom uh, released is called OpenLR. OpenLR is a way of describing a location in a geometrical network uh, of a certain map provider, but it can be used across map maps. So not only maps from TomTom, but also maps from others. And that is important if you describe traffic information and you want to sell this traffic information, but you don't know if the receiver is using our map or somebody, well, somebody else's map. Uh, and I think that that really became also an ISO standard. So really a, an ISO TISA TPEG standard, which is a, in, in our industry is an important standard. So basically TomTom contributed by open sourcing that technology, making uh, efforts to get it uh, adopted as an industry standard. And now people in the location technology industry, so also our competitors are using OpenLR, for instance, to describe traffic information, which makes integrating traffic information inside a car much more easier than it was before. Right, so this is, I think, a good example of, uh, of an open source project which we where we done, and, and actually I built a whole company on that, uh, so that that can also happen if you do it. Yeah. I hope that answers your question a bit. It does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have this opportunity right now since I have like an expert and I have my students over here, and uh, as a closing question from my side, so. Um, Many times when I'm organizing hackathons, uh, I get the reaction of the students saying like, yeah, I'm not going to participate in the hackathon because all these companies, they just want to steal my ideas and like so on and so forth. And then I try to, to explain like, listen, we can actually create an open source license that comes together with a um, hackathon, right? So uh, the company could potentially use your idea, but you know, there is no limitations to it. And the question is actually, in your professional opinion, right? This is what you do for a living. So, what would be the correct um, license that we should use in a normal hackathon? It's a student, it's a school, you know, that we can maybe, you know, like draft it. And then every single time, if there is a company that wants to organize the, the hackathon over here and, and use the brains of our students, then we can actually ask them. So, Tell them like, okay, this is you know the license that we like to collaborate based on. Any any ideas? Uh, yeah, I, I do, but it's uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a, a lawyer, but it, it is a bit complex because the first question you need to address is who owns it. So if that's, uh, that's so, I'm not trying to you know get rid of the question, but it's really about you m must have a statement on if the student creates the code, who retains the copyright? Is it the student or is it the school? Is it it's always the student. I think according to the 42 network, yeah. the way we work, every single project that you do within the curriculum, it's yours. Yeah. It's not even the columns for yeah. uh, 42 networks. Yeah, so in that case, uh, th that is important because I think, uh, as I just said, for instance, in MIT license, that you still have to do these attributions like copyright by me. I, I, I thought of these things and then if you license it, other companies can use it, but you end up in the screen, as I just saw you, like, uh, hey, uh, we use this code from, uh, you know, uh, Felix or uh, Victoria, copyright Victoria, blah, blah, blah. Uh, th that is the, the honor you, <laughs> you will get. And then from a license perspective, I think, uh, uh, phew, I have to be very careful because, the, the, but, but, but MIT license or Apache license are our are, are, are go-to kind of, licenses which are also accepted by companies yeah? because if you would like if you would say hey we're, we're all like the you know uh, I like copy left from from other reasons but you know in, in I understand in a company this is difficult so you don't want to have really permissive licenses or restrictive licenses because the companies will not use that they will never use uh, uh, or at least never I mean some companies won't use uh, a GNU public license because it has the copy left tag in it. But if you license it as an, an MIT or Apache license, it's, it's, it's a pretty much a go-to kind of standard thing you do. But always, always read the verbatim because um, um, it's important. Thank you so much. Actually, next time when I, um, uh, we're going to get closer for the upcoming year towards a hackathon, I'll get back to you because this thing, I think our students are right to ask for it. And yeah. so far, we don't have it yet, uh, like, set in stone, like I always uh, mention it to the, to the companies. 
But I think it's time to actually formalize. Yeah. Also for the people from uh, Barcelona and so on and so forth, you can also ask your uh, staff members to arrange that for you. Because in the end of the day, it's your creation. Yeah, maybe maybe 42 should have an uh, open source program office. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we are eight people managing 356. Yeah. Years. I don't think we can add no, this. No, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to help wherever I can. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Felix. Let's give a round of applause for that. Thank you. Thank you so much.